good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today we're hosting a round table uh, celebrating 50 years of Afuru. Uh, my name is Marcel, I'm part of the Africult Collective, um, and Henry and Zahida will also be coming up to deliver a series of papers in response to uh, the novel itself, so looking at the content of the novel um, as well as Flora Nwapa's legacy. Uh, Africult is a platform that, that, um, sorry, that explores, discusses, and celebrates African literature on virtual and physical spaces. Um, after we've delivered our series of papers, we will then be entering into a discussion for about 10, 15 minutes with Yovanka and Yossi from Ain't I a Woman Collective, which is an online pl platform that centers the voices of African women. So, I will go first. And my paper is called The Makings of Womanhood Patience. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Great. When reading the opening pages of Afuru, I was struck by the strong sense of orality projecting from Nawapa's words. I felt cozied by the narration, like a grandmother's voice carrying me through the story, gently guiding me on the tale of a young woman's quest for love. Efuru Ogeni, the eponymous lead character, demonstrates the virtue of compromise and negotiation in her dealings with love and marriage. From the onset, the reader is introduced to a woman who is independent-minded, not faced by material or monetary possession. Rather, she is willing to compromise her highly esteemed status to elope with a poor farmer who cannot afford the dowry. In page three, it reads, the young man told his mother that Afuru was his wife. I have no money for the dowry yet. Afuru herself understands this. We have agreed to be husband and wife and that is all that matters. The young man's mother was excited for her son had indeed made a good choice. You are welcome, my daughter, but your father, what will you say to him? Leave that to me. I shall settle it myself, says Afuru. What we see here is a wife who is willing to abandon custom in the first instance, following her, her husband's dictation. And what we also see is a woman confident in handling a delicate situation in order to avoid bringing shame to both her father's name and her husband's. When reading Afuru, one thing struck me. The protagonist is aware that there are limitations to her freedom and that acting independently should not render all traditional practices. Rather, traditions of the Igbo are what guide and influence her decisions and ultimately her confidence. We see a woman from early on in the story who is caught between two men in her life and her astute ability to navigate between them in ensuring that the right thing is done. A woman at the mercy of her reputation being potentially sullied and obliterated for eloping without the dowry being exchanged between the two men, the two families. It could also be interpreted as both men are pillars upholding her name and virtue, that they are the gateway to the town's opinion of her. So what we truly see at stake here is a Furu's response and negotiation with the Igbo custom. And why is that? Throughout the novel, women characters pulsate desires to be approved, to serve, to be respected. Most importantly, there is a, there is a throbbing desire to be loved. Nuapa writes women with multiplicities, women with varying personalities and interests. They are not stock characters to fill up the vacancies of the village setting. These women... These are women who construct a body of womanhood and at its core, at the heartbeat of womanhood, is the ideal of what makes a woman, what makes a respectable woman, a good wife and a bountiful mother, patience. In our roundtable discussion, I'd like to present how patience feeds into the women's psyche, their interpretation of it, and how it also weaves the society's idea of womanhood. In a critical turning of Afuru's first marriage, where her husband runs off with and runs off to Indoni with another woman, we see the advisory patients mentioned in conjunction with what makes a good wife and mother. For instance, from her aunt-in-law, Ajanupu, she says, 
My advice is this, my dear child. Be patient and wait. Leave Adizua with, with this woman. He will soon be tired of her, and you will resume your position again. From her mother-in-law, Osai. It pays to be patient. I have been patient myself all my life. You don't know what my life had been. No woman of today can suffer as I have suffered. Even her father advises patience. I understand you, my daughter, but have patience. Wait until he returns from Indoni. I shall see him then. Meanwhile, go home and be a good mother to your daughter. To which Afru responds, does it not occur to my mother-in-law, Ajanupu, and my father that Aduzua is satisfied with this woman? Our ancestors forbid that I should wait for a man to drive me out of his house. This is done to women who cannot stand by themselves, women who have no good homes, and not to me, the daughter of Nwashiki Ojini. And besides, my face is not bent. I am still a beautiful woman. Patience is coupled with suffering, which Afuru is not willing to endure if it requires, again, her reputation and dignity being at the mercy of her husband. Here we see her take on patience and what weight she's willing to place on such advice and her self-encouragement, emphasizing that she is a woman of her own. In her second marriage to Enneberi, she is chosen by the late goddess Uhamiri, to be one of her worshippers, Uhamiri, the woman of the lake, as the goddess is often referred to as in the novel, um, is known for her blessing, for blessing her worshippers with wealth and prosperity in, in trade, but not with motherhood. The novel ends with a furu dreaming of the goddess, who is at the bottom of the lake, brushing her long hair, completely content, never having experienced the joys of motherhood. Similarly with where we find our protagonist at this point, husbandless and childless, but content in herself. Though she is only now content with herself after having experienced the pain of having and losing both. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Henry Breffel. Um, as a caveat, I would like to apologize for any mispronunciation of Igbo words and names. Um, so, I'll be, so I'll be looking at reconceptualization um, womanhood is a woman's world. Afuru marks the advent of the women's right back tradition in African literature. In Afuru, Flo Anwapa simultaneously offers a dynamic and dialectic interrogation of womanhood and explores the capacity of women's agency within patriarchal structures. For the purposes of this discussion, I would focus on two major features of Nwapa's work and how it fostered countercultural representation of women in African literature. After the death of her only child, Ogunim, the eponymous heroine is robbed of the joy of motherhood. Condemned to barrenness, her misfortune satiates idle gossips, which calls her womanhood into question. During her second marriage to Gilbert, the fruitless intimacy of their companionship is met with bitter remarks. For instance, Upon seeing the husband and wife go into the stream together, one of the women remarks to her friends, marriage must be fruitful. Of what use if your husband licks your body, worships you, and buys everything in the market for you, and you're not productive? Whilst the gossiping woman measure a furious worth as a woman by her infertility, others stalls her as a good woman and wife based on her generosity, kindness of heart, and virtuous qualities. Throughout the novel, Nwapa uses everyday form of dialogue, such as gossip and chit-chats, as sites of discursive practices, where she challenges ideas of gender by carefully dichotomizing womanhood and motherhood as distinct variables of identification. Implicitly, she subverts normative notions of gender Normative notions of gender norms that limits a woman's worth and identity to her womb. In a sense, Nwapa facilitate extra and intertextual dialogue calling into revision, romanticization, and signification of women as cultural sites of reproduction, prevalent in African male literary canon and negritude writings, commonly referred to as the mother thrope, mother Africa thrope. Pride in the role of women in Africa beyond the realm of the womb, 
nor preferred as situate, women at the center of the history of colonial resistance and social economic transformation. According to Stratton, Noap employs the convention of the paired woman to re-examine the heterogeneity and complexity of African women's struggles towards liberation. Noap explores African women agency through a lateral reflexive transposition of her central female characters. Asai, a furious mother-in-law, is said to have succumbed to her suffering and resigned to faith. Ajinopo, her older sister, is a tough woman whose manners and attitude have been hardened over the years by the oppressive structures of colonial and traditional patriarchy. Nevertheless, her ability to transmute her anger into transformational resistance, it's compromised by her strict adherence to customs. That said, her belief in the necessity of self-expression marks her as a voice of dissent as she reminds Ufuru if you don't lick your mouth, the hamatan will lick it for you. You stay there and talk of being quiet these days. Efuru, on the other hand, charts a different path towards emancipation. Respecting traditional values whilst transgressing social expectations, she adapts to the transitions in society spurred by colonialism. She embarks on commerce and wealth accumulation as a means to self-independence. She also plays a major philanthropic role in her society, offering financial support to her friends and neighbors, although this comes at the price of marriage and childbirth. However, at the end of the novel, she's rewarded immensely with contentment, beauty, and wealth by the water goddess Uhamiri, a veritable symbol of female empowerment and freedom. In my view, Flora Nwapa is more than a champion of African women's empowerment by the trailblazer who did not only challenge post-colonial male hegemony, but initiated and fashioned a style and form of writing that engendered an African womanist cosmology. Evident in a characterization, use of language, and aesthetics. So today, as we celebrate Flora Noape's Golden Jubilee, we must also take cognizance of her impact on subsequent generation of writers such as Bucci and Machetta, uh, Nafisato Diallo, Amata Edu, Sisida Garemba, Chimamanda, and many more. Thank you very much. My name is Zahed Nabagarika, and I'm going to be looking at the continued impact of Nwapa and Efuru. The impact Efuru has had on African literature and women's writing is vast. Looking at Nwapa's other novels, for instance, themes such as womanhood and motherhood frequently resurface. Amaka, in One is Enough, published in 1981, takes on the same struggle with barrenness that Ufuru went through, asking herself difficult but unavoidable questions like, was she unfulfilled because she had no child? Was a woman nothing because she was unmarried or barren? Despite the fact that Ufuru and Amaka both face childlessness within marriage, the choices these characters make are quite different, which illustrates the width and breadth of Nwapa's ability to capture and represent the layered complexity of female experience. Ufuru's ending is ambiguous, marked by Ufuru's observation that the water goddess had never experienced the joy of motherhood, while Amaka's choice to join the Cash Madame Club gives a stark contrast. The idea of womanhood being tied to women's reproductive ability is evident in other Nigerian women's writing too. Butchi Emacheta, for example, went on to quote Afuru's observation as the title of her fifth novel, The Joys of Motherhood, published in 1979. Nwapa's own position on this subject is, in my view, best exemplified in an interview she gave in 1990, where she said that the core message of her writing was that there are 101 other things you can, that can make you happy apart from marriage and children. Taking this into consideration then, if we now look at the impact Nwapa has had on publishing, it's clear to see that she too was naturally endowed with the industrious qualities of some of her heroines. The two publishing houses she set up in the 1970s, Tana Press and Flora Nwapa Company, were to oversee the printing and distribution of her work within Nigeria. In doing this, she not only demonstrated how industrious she was, but also daring, as African literature in English during this time was more or less dominated by men. The same can be said for literary criticism on the subject, not to mention publishing. 
being able to write novels as one way to challenge previous male representations of womanhood was important. So in setting up her own publishing company, she was not only topping the, that initial precedent she set by getting a Furu published, but also recognizing that more could be done to address the need for literature that focused on women's narratives from women's perspectives. The fact that Nuapa was willing and able to go that step further in controlling the means of production and circulation of her novels means that ultimately she was able to retain full creative control. So Shayla Nasta has asserted that during the 1980s, African women writers wrote back to African male writers, seeking to correct men's stereotypes of women in a similar way to how those very same male African writers had critiqued and written back to colonial misrepresentations of themselves. Nuapa, though, went beyond writing back, which is a really important legacy to remember and something that I would say is actually still very evident in publishing practices on the continent today. For example, FemWrite, also known as Uganda Women Writers Association, was founded in 1995 by Mary Okorut with the aim of addressing and developing women's literary narratives in Uganda. Femright is celebrating 20 years of existence this year, an existence that has supported many talented Ugandan women writing in English and aided them in being shortlisted for, but also winning um, various international literary prizes and awards. To me, this highlights the continued importance and necessity of what Flora Nwapa started in Nigeria in the 1970s, the need for publishing platforms to be created that specifically voice women's narratives within contemporary African literature in English. Nwapa astutely recognized that the publishers she was dealing with in the 1960s and 70s were perhaps not as interested in the themes and issues she wanted to address in her novels as she was. She therefore looked outside of these well-established structures and created her own, a model that others have successfully followed. Femrite in Uganda, Modaji Books in South Africa, Kwani and Jalada in Kenya, to name a few. So, it's important to celebrate Flora Nwapa and Afuru, but also to remember that without her, contemporary African literature might not be what it is today. Thank you.